Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Finland Mennonite on YouTube. Glad you could join us again. We've been working through the book of Ephesians, and we're up to chapter 3 today. Now, we've already seen so far in chapter 1 that God's people are chosen together, and we saw in chapter 2 that God's people are joined together. Today, we're going to see the importance of God's people being commissioned together. And now, chapter 2, it ends with God's people being built together into a dwelling place. And so that idea of God's people being built together and the idea of a building, it had me thinking about construction. Now, in construction, what what does an architect do? I think about what an architect does. If you're sitting with someone, tell them, shout out, what, what does an architect do? Um, right? They, they design the building. And so, okay, great, you hire an architect. Uh, then what does the architect do? Right after you, they, they might sit with you. They might ask you for uh, what your intent and purpose of this new space is going to be. And then they do what? They go off and they they start drawing up ideas. And now it's not like they just come with one idea and they say, well, here's your idea. Thanks for hiring me for your services. No, no, no. An architect, they're going to come with like five or six ideas. And we say, well, you can do it this way. Or if you don't like that, here's another suggestion. Or if you change the windows or the roof line or the room layout, you, you could be all these different options. So they always come with multiple ideas. Now, let's say on a particular job that you end up picking number three. But for some reason, what ends up happening is different contractors get different designs. And so uh, let's say for argument's sake, that the concrete crew, they get design one. They think design one was the pick uh, that was made. Uh, the carpenters, though, they get design two sent to them. All the drawings for design two go to the carpenters. The plumbers, they get design three, which is actually is the real one, but to them it was supposed to be that anyway. Uh, the electricians, they get design four. And the window company... They get design five. Now, let's just, designs are going to be different. They're going to be maybe incredibly different. So how is this project going to end if five different contractors get five different sets of drawings based on five completely different concepts for what this building or space is going to look like, right? How's that going to turn out? See, these, these contractors, they were chosen together. They were joined together. They, had, they have to be. They have to work together. But because they weren't commissioned together, this project is going to fail. Uh, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be headache and frustration and pointing the fingers and all kinds of stuff. Now, if you're one of those contractors, how are you feeling in, in all of this? Uh, Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you're annoyed. Uh, maybe you're looking back, oh, what was what was all this waste for? Like, I, I put all my time into ordering the materials based off this drawing only to find out that, well, I can't use that and that had to be sent back. And uh, I don't think that'd be a very good experience for anyone involved. Here's the thing, though. The same thing can happen to anyone, particularly in... in regards to Ephesians, where Paul's writing a letter to a group of people at a church, he's seemingly saying, hey, watch out that uh, you don't end up finding yourselves in the same place of frustration. So you can be chosen together and joined together, but if you're not commissioned together, if you're not focused on the same thing, if you don't know that you're working together for the same goal, uh, things can go really wrong. So, if you have your Bibles, open with me to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to read through it. We're going to see what it has to say about being commissioned together and what difference that makes among God's people. We don't want to end up like those five contractors. So here's what it says. Paul starts off by saying, uh, for this reason. And so for what reason? Well, we go back a couple verses and it's this idea of in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. For this reason, verse 1 of chapter 3, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. 
when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister or a servant according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you to not lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And so, man, that, that what an awesome chapter of of Ephesians here by by Paul, and it starts off with a with an amazing truth that he's trying to get across. In fact, he's he's already said this once in chapter two. He's coming back to it again to make sure that it's not missed in chapter three. And it's this: Gentiles, verse six. Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the same promise in Christ. Jesus. Now you may be saying, why is this such a big deal? I don't I don't even know what Gentiles are. Well, Gentiles means really just not Jewish, uh, which in Paul's day carried with it this idea that not not part of God's chosen people, not part of God's family, right? Outsiders, ones that don't belong. But what's Paul saying here? He's saying, no, 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 no. In Christ, everything changes. In fact, if you read through the first three chapters from uh, start to finish, you'll, you'll notice no less than 21 times where there's a reference to being in Christ that's accompanied with a promise of what it means to be in Christ. It's an awesome lens to read through the book of Ephesians. Here's just a couple of these promises. And in chapter 2, verse 6, we see that in Christ we are raised up and seated with him in the heavenly places. That's followed up by verse 7, which says that in Christ we, we experience the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness. In chapter 1, verse 9, we see that in Christ is God is uniting all things together, right? In Christ. So if Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers or partners of the promise, like all these things that Paul's laying out in chapter three, he's saying, yeah, Gentiles have this too. Well then friends, we're more than simply chosen together, even joined together. We're also being commissioned together. Well, commissioned for what? You might ask. Well, in uh, chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says this as well about in Christ. He says, for we, we, you and me, all of God's people, we are his workmanship, created, here's that phrase, in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's an amazing, an amazing verse. And I do believe it has individual application. But for this morning, 
I really just want to focus on the communal aspect of this verse, which uh, may bring you to a, a question. Like, how do we live this verse out together? I, yeah, Chris, I could follow you along if you said this was just an individual application, that God has this, this plan that he had created for me to walk in. But what does it mean that God has this plan for us? What does it mean that God has a plan for we? Right? Notice it's we are his workmanship. Good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, how do we live that out? Well, Paul, I believe, gives us two very clear ways of living this out in chapter 3 of Ephesians. And the first one is found in verse 10, which says this. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And he goes on, he says, we can do this with boldness and confidence. But here's my question for you. Now, I want you to think about this for a little. I'm not just going to give you the answer right away. Talk to someone that's next to you or, or pause this, um, or I might just leave a little bit of time for blank. Like, what is Paul talking about here? What is verse 10 of, what does this mean? Like, honestly, if a friend were to ask you, hey, what in the world is Paul saying here? Or, hey, I've been reading this Bible. You, you told me I should read it, and I did. I read Ephesians because you said it'd be a good place to read, and what is Paul talking about in chapter 3, verse 10? Like, what would you say to them? How would you summarize this? How would you explain this verse? That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Think about that for a moment. Talk to the person next to you. What do you got? Chat it out. Send it in the chat. Shoot me an email. What do you think this means? Hmm. Well, give you a little more time to think here. A little bit more time to talk it out. But you know what? There are some clues. Maybe take a look at verse 14. Verse 14. What's Paul doing in verse 14? All right, because he's obviously he's writing this letter, and yet his posture changes in verse 4. What's happening in verse 14? What's he doing? He's praying. That's right, he's praying. It's this wonderful prayer. It's another beautiful, amazing prayer that I would encourage you to pray this prayer over people this coming week. In fact, if you use the Dig Deeper sheet, which is normally attached uh, to this video, it's below, there's a link. You can find it on our website, finlandmc.org. There's a Dig Deeper that helps you dive even deeper into the text. It gives you experiential activities, and that's the activity this week, is to pray this prayer because... Man, this prayer is awesome in verse 14, right? He's praying. That's what he's doing. But what were the three opening words of the prayer in verse 14? He says, for this reason, I bow my knees. For this reason. For, for what reason? Well, just as... Chapter 3, verse 1 began with, for this reason, and we went back a verse to go, what's he talking about? We're going to do the same thing here. What's he talking about? Well, right before he says, for this reason, he says this. This was according to the eternal purpose that was realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. And right before that, it's verse 10, right? The verse that's on the screen right now, that's for this reason. For what reason? For the reason that we have boldness to access God the Father. And then he starts praying. What is he talking about doing? He's talking about praying. If we are to be his workmanship, walking in the ways he's prepared for us to walk in, we have got to be people of prayer. We've got to be people of prayer. Think about the places you live, work, and play. Think about places you go to school if you're still in school. The reality is we don't all work in the same company. We don't all go to the same school. We don't all hang out at the same spots. We don't even all have the same interests. In fact, many of our own schedules within our immediate families, we see less and less overlap as the years go. And yet it's through the church, Paul says, 
that the manifold wisdom of God may be known, right? So here's the question. If that's the case, if it's through the church that this manifold wisdom is made known, which sounds a whole lot to me like praying, if the God's people are meant to be praying, and we might even say engaging in spiritual warfare against these rulers and authorities that he's alluding to here, well, then the question we need to ask is what kind of prayer with rhythms can we develop to make this happen? Right? That's one of the things I want you to think about. In your own life, what prayer rhythms can you establish with other people? Right? When can you pray with other believers? Any ideas? Again, hit the pause button if you want. Take time and talk with the person you're watching this with. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a small group. Maybe it's a, a friend. Talk to that person. Where can you make prayer be a regular rhythm in your lives together? Maybe it's with schoolmates. Maybe it's with coworkers. Maybe it's some sort of a family huddle before you all leave for the day. Maybe it's a family huddle at night because the morning time doesn't work. How are we bathing things in prayer? How are we as the church making known the manifold wisdom of God? Together, right? Prayer must saturate everything we do. And I encourage you to use this prayer to saturate your workplace, your school, your, your sports teams, the places you go shopping, the places you work out, the places you run, the, the places you hang out. See what happens when you saturate those places and the people that you see there with Ephesians 3, 14 to 22, 14 to 21 kind of prayers. Do it for a week see what happens. And then email me. Let me know what happens when you started praying these things. Inform me of the things God does when we turn to him in prayer, because that's how we are his workmanship. That's how we know we're walking in his ways as we're praying. We're saturating everything in prayer. That was the one thing. The second thing, right? It's walking in it in God's ways begins with prayer, but the second piece needed to continue walking in his ways is found in verse 20. Here's what it says in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. Now if you've been following along throughout the whole book of Ephesians so far, we know that Paul, he's already prayed that we would be strengthened with power. That's chapter 3, 16. And that we would know the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might when he raised Jesus from the dead. That's 1, 19 and 20. So that resurrection power is at work in his people. But it's not just in me, and it's not just in you, and it's not just in, think of any other Christian and plug their name in, right? It's in us, according to the power at work within us. Us. It's this whole idea of being better together. You can see it on the puzzle pieces above my head, right? Better together. Here's, here's some examples of what this looks like. This idea that it's not just my power or strengths or gifts. It's, it's also your power, strengths, and gifts. And it's all of ours working together because if we tried it on our own, we're going to fail. We're going to fall. We're going to disappoint. We're going to come up short. Some examples I was thinking of. Uh, just just yesterday, we were out building snowmen in the in the snow that we got. And you know what? I'll be honest. I thought it was a lost cause. I'm like, this isn't snow for building snowmen. This is really nice skiing snow. And and if I was alone, I'd have walked away. I'd been like, well, it was worth a try, but meh, I'm done. But I wasn't alone. I had my daughter Paige with me. And she had a much different opinion about whether we could build a snowman or not. So we persevered a little bit more and I helped her gather some snow together. And then I ended up did go inside, but other of her siblings showed up and they had an, in, an incredible time making amazing snowmen in snow that I thought was a lost cause that I would have given up on a long time ago. But they realized, hey, together 
we can be creative. And they ended up not building snowmen ultra high. They ended up building them more horizontal and changing the layout and being creative and thinking differently about it, but making an amazing product, an amazing snow people when it was all said and done. Some really creative snowman building techniques. I think of a, a thing we do as a family called Wordle. Wordle, if you, it's W-O-R-D-L-E. -O -O Just Google it. It's a website, and it's basically this challenge where every day you've got to guess the five-letter word, and it's just five blanks, and you just guess a five-letter word, and then it tells you, like, if you get a green, if it colors in a letter green, that means it's the right letter in the right spot. If it colors in yellow, it's the right letter, wrong spot, and if it's gray, it's the wrong letter. It's kind of like mastermind, but with words. And so we do it together. It's a great exercise to do together, but if I'm honest, sometimes my family members make some guesses at words that I'm just like, I roll my eyes at. I'm like, that is a that is such a silly guess. Why would you possibly guess that? In fact, my my son did that today, uh, Logan, and and just made this word that I'm like, that is not gonna work. They did it anyway, and it wasn't the right word, but it gave the clue needed to get the right word because it put two letters in the right spot, even though it was, in my mind, just a kind of silly guess. I never would have put that word in. I never would have thought of that word. And it means I probably wouldn't have solved the right word for today, right? Because it took different strengths working together that we were able to solve that word. In fact, we haven't, we've never made it where we didn't get the word yet. We've always gotten the word when we work together. Maybe I'll ask it this way. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and after it's done, you think of all the things you wish you would have said, all the questions you wish you would have asked, the tones you wish you would have utilized? I, I know I have, especially when it's just me. And then I think about other times when I'm look back on a conversation, I went, wow, that was that was a really great conversation. And, and I find that most of those times is when I'm not alone, but when I have another person with me. For example, I thought of a time I was sitting at a McDonald's and a friend was with me, a friend Colin, and we're sitting there having lunch and, and uh, 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 a missionary uh, of the Mormon church came up and started dialoguing with us. And what was amazing was as we were dialoguing with this individual, I would ask a question and talk back and forth, and then Colin would jump in. And as he's jumping in and talking, I'm able to listen, but I'm also reflecting more. And, and I'm recognizing that, wow, the two of us are doing a pretty amazing job at connecting and making connections with this person from a faith that's kind of similar to Christianity, yet has some very strong differences, some very distinct differences that would be very different than the than the uh, what, what we would believe as followers of Jesus from the Christian faith. And I was just so thankful that it wasn't just me because then I would have been looking back going, why didn't I say this? Why did I say that? Right? I saw the power at work when more than one were together engaging someone else. See, we're commissioned together. We're joined together, we're chosen together, but we're commissioned together. The power that God wants to have uh, demonstrated to the world in us and through us is only kind of seen fully when it's us and not you. So here's my question that I have for you this morning. Where are you trying to do things on your own strength? And where do you need to let others into your life? See, the power isn't within you to overcome. It's within the body of believers collectively. We, together in Christ Jesus, make up the body of Christ. We, together in Christ Jesus, have the power of God. We, together in Christ Jesus, will make known the wisdom, the goodness, the love, the mercy, the grace, and the truth of God. The call to follow Jesus is not a solo venture. It's a group activity. So I ask you again, 
where are you trying to do things on your own strength? And where do you need to let others into your life? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for all those who are watching. I pray that they would have connection with others so that they could experience this better together commissioned reality of being your people. Lord, help us all to let our walls down, to uh, allow others into our situations where we're not just relying on our own strength, but we're relying on each other collectively. We're living together for your glory with others collectively. Lord, uh, do amazing things in us and through us this week as we work together with others to share your love, your truth, your grace, your mercy with each other and the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining us again, for following along with us as we work through the book of Ephesians, and I want to send you with these words. According to the riches of his glory, may God grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. And as you go in his strength, may God do immeasurably more than all you can ask or imagine this week. Have a blessed week.